Good morning, everyone. My name is Rev. Jen, Jen Young Sun Ru, and I have the pleasure of serving this wonderful congregation as its minister. Our worship associate called in sick today, and so um, I get to welcome you, and also I get to welcome our special guest preacher today. He is my friend and colleague from my home church in Baltimore, Maryland, and we're doing a green pulpit exchange. So nobody's getting on an airplane, um, but we are doing this pulpit exchange, and you're going to hear from Reverend David on the big screen today. <laughs> David Carl Olson is completing his 13th year of service at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. He is the co-chair of the Religious Leaders Caucus of the community organization Bridge, and he serves on the board of the UU Legislative Ministry of Maryland. He has served congregations all over the country, including Flint, Michigan, and Roxbury, Dorchester, and Boston, Massachusetts. Before entering the ministry, Reverend Olson was a cultural worker, a member of the core group of Little Flags Theater, a working class political theater company, and there he earned his actor's equity card at Wheelock Family Theater, performing traditional plays with non-traditional casting, and serving as the artist-in-residence to underserved communities in inner city and rural settings in Massachusetts. His activism around Central American and Caribbean solidarity and his commitment to the struggles of the working class have helped shape his queer identity and compassionate ministry. Welcome, Reverend Olson, today, and welcome to all of you. If today is the very first time that you are with us, we would love to get to know you better. Right after service, you are invited to the welcome room, which is in the south foyer. It's in that direction. And there will be people there to help answer your questions about our church and our faith and just to say hello and greet you. Uh, and if you're online, the link to our visitor form is being dropped in the chat right now. So you can do that while you're online. Um, I'm so grateful that we have this multi-platform capacity so that people can join us from wherever they are at any time. You know, we all come to Sunday morning worship carrying all kinds of things with us. And so as you enter the sanctuary and at any moment during the service, please feel free to go over to that corner where you can light a candle for a joy or sorrow that you're carrying today, or you can write a note in our book, or you can place a stone in water as a ritual to express all that you are carrying and feeling today. During the week, anyone can go to the pastoral care portal on our website and let the ministers know what you're going through. And those joining from home can write their joys and sorrows in the Zoom chat, which will be open pretty much for the entire service until we get to the sermon. We gather in worship to find meaning and to live more deeply. Worship creates connections within, among, and beyond us, calling us to our better selves and calling us to live with wisdom and compassion. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your image of the holy, we are so glad to see you. Amen. We light this chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, with words from the Reverend Howard Thurman. If you want to follow along, this is number 498 in the Gray Hymnal. 498, that's the section where the readings and the prayers are. In the quietness of this place, surrounded 
by the all-pervading presence of the holy, the heart whispers, keep fresh before us moments of our high resolve that in good times or in tempest, we may not forget that to which our lives are committed. Keep fresh before us the moments of our high resolve, and now, let us say together the words of our mission, which affirm our shared purpose. Powered by love, we transform ourselves and serve our world. Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you. I'm very touched by the Howard Thurman quotation was something I used yesterday, <laughs> open a meeting um, fighting for educational equity in Baltimore County. My name is David Carl Olson and I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, these words come from the pastoral and community ministry of William S. Alberts. Our steeple is the aspirations of people. Our altar is the common ground upon which all persons walk. Our cross is the oppression from which any people seek to liberate themselves. Our creed is the deeply held belief that community enhances individuality and individuality community. Friends, friends, let us worship together. So I'm going to tell a story. Today's story comes from the Jewish tradition. And we borrow this story from our neighboring faith with awareness and sensitivity to the fact that hate crimes against the Jewish people have been rising over the past several years, locally and nationally. And so with much gratitude for their rich legacy of Hasidic storytelling, here is Rami Shapiro's version of one classic tale. This is about Reb Meir and Reb Israel. And they were the best of friends, these two. And yet, no two people could ever have been so totally different. Now, Reb Meir lived in modest poverty. And he never let a day go by without making sure that the people in his neighborhood had enough to eat. And so, before he went to bed at night, he would spend his last penny on whoever needed it. Now, Reb Israel was a little bit different. He lived like a grand king. Now, these two friends met one day out in the, in the road as they were each preparing to take a journey to different places. And Reb Meir was sitting on a simple cart drawn by one kind of scrawny looking horse. Reb Israel, on the other hand, was riding in a rich lacquered coach pulled by four powerful stallions. Reb Israel walked over to the horse hitched to Reb Meir's wagon, and with mock concern, he inspected the horse with great care, and he turned to his friend, with barely concealed humor and said to him, um, I always travel with four strong horses. In this way, if my coach should ever get stuck in the mud, they will be able to freely um, get out of it quickly. I can see, however, that your horse seems barely able to carry you and your wagon on a dry, hard-packed road there's bound to be mud on your travels. Why take such risks? Well, Reb Meir stepped down from his wagon and walked over to his friend, 
who was still standing next to Reb Mayer's horse placing his arms around his beloved old horse's neck, Reb Mayer said softly, ah, the risk I think is yours. Because I travel with this one horse that in no way can free a wagon from a mud pile um, if they become stuck in the mud, I am very careful then to avoid the mud in the first place. You, my friend, are certain you can get free if stuck, and thus do not look where you are going. <laughs> there we go. That's just wonderful. One of the great things about exchanges is hearing uh, the innovations in, in, uh, in worship, including beautiful music. Thank you so much. Let's join our hearts in the spirit of prayer. O oh, thou whom no person at any time hath seen, but whose blessings are revealed in the creative source of all creation, and maybe in this month, even in our queer fabulousness, we marvel in awe at the expansiveness of your creation. Your margins of diversity are boundless, and for that we are grateful. And all of our feelings are being sad and mad and glad and scared. All of our feelings are held in this expansiveness, and we and our lives and our relations are held too. Each of our siblings, beloved LGBTQIA+, and straight folk, black and indigenous and other people of color, siblings of many genders and abilities, all are beautifully and wonderfully made, all together queer and straight, young and old, people of many nations, all together in the divine image. Teach us, teach us to love people just as they are and to embrace our own identity fully, even as universal love has embraced us. We pray for loving kindness to be our watchword in this world. Loving kindness for ourselves, yes. Loving kindness for the other, and maybe even especially the other with whom we may have a problem or for whom we may be a problem. And finally, we we imagine loving kindness for the big we of creation and open our consciousness to the interconnected web of existence of which we are a part. And we sing and believe, may we, that big, bigger, biggest we of our consciousness, may we be filled with loving kindness. Let's be in a meditative space. Okay, did you read my lips well? <laughs> Forgive me. I'm reading from uh, Religion for Greatness, a little tiny book written uh, close to the end of the Second World War by Clarence Russell Skinner, the Dean of the Theological School at Tufts University, one of Crane, Crane was an old Universalist uh, academy. There's a little optimism here, but maybe optimism's a good thing. So insight comes to human beings, whether primitive or modern, whether naive or sophisticated, beneath all curious customs and beliefs, deeper than ecclesiastical creeds, more vital and basic than priestly rites, stands out one impressive fact. Namely, humanity touches infinity. 
Our home is in immensity. We live, move, and have our being in an eternity. This magnificent assertion is our greatest affirmation. Nothing else surpasses it in sweep of imagination or depth of understanding. It is a truth proclaimed by all that we know of modern science. It stands the test of experience as the enduring reality. The insightful religion of the unities and the universals is a radical cure. It digs into the soil of humanity, selfishness and superstitions and distortions. It destroys the vicious partialisms which would lock us up into divisive cells of race, of gender, of class, denying us our common rights of humanity. This enemy, partialism, must be routed out on every front, economic, social, biological, cultural. The only way to rout it is to supplant the fears and errors of partialism by a vigorous, realistic religion of universalism. We must think, feel, and act in universal terms and thus see how petty and sinful are the partialisms of our lesser selves. We must expand our spiritual powers that we vastly increase the range of our understanding and sympathy. There is no other way. It is greatness universalism, or perish. Let me begin by saying thank you for the invitation to be with you this morning, or this afternoon, which is what it is out here, but that's another story. The tradition of Unitarian Universalist ministers swapping pulpits, as it were, goes back to the very beginning of our congregational tradition. We believed from the beginning that it was congregations that had the capacity to understand what God intended for them without some authority higher than their own group conscience, determined by their own democracy. It was a radical assertion, but we also felt from the beginning that there was value in being associated with one another, congregation to congregation, and that by associating with one another, we might better hear God's intentions for us. We might hear it more fully by hearing what other congregations were coming to know. And so from the beginning, we gathered in associations where we would advise each other about all manner of things, especially in the qualifications of our ministers, while it is a congregation that ordains and calls a minister, it was always done with the participation of those churches with whom our congregations were associated. And we maintained connections in an organic way when ministers swapped pulpits. Our congregations would hear a different perspective. We'd be challenged about the ways our our hearts and our habits may have gone cold, or we might be brought back into the center if we spent too much time dancing around the edges. Uh, your minister, Reverend Jen Young Sun Ru, came home to Baltimore earlier this year when she preached for our congregation, and I was so pleased that she extended an invitation for me to be here with you today in this green exchange. I love that. We love Reverend Drew and have been very proud to follow her, her career in ministry as chaplain and as pastor. And we wish every blessing on her ministry to you and her ministry with you to this beautiful world. Each Sunday in Baltimore, our worship leaders speak an affirmation, come, come, whoever you are, 
Whatever your gender, whatever your age, whatever your beliefs, whatever your skin color, you are welcome here this morning. And then the whole people say together, all are welcome at the table. But would you join me right now and say that affirmation with me? All are welcome at the table. Now we know this as an aspiration. We know that our welcome, though genuine, is incomplete. We have more growing to do to make such an invitation fully real. But there is an interesting thing about this particular sanctuary and its tables to which all are welcome. And so I thought I might wanna show you a little bit of our space. You can see some stuff behind me, but when our founders had our sanctuary constructed, they chose a space that was not in the center of town where their own homes, or at least their town homes and offices were, but it was out at the edge where new growth was happening. They purchased a lot very close to where a cathedral was being built to be the Cathedral of the United States. Any Catholics in the crowd probably know how important Baltimore has been in the development of Catholicism in the United States. Maybe might even remember their Baltimore Catechism. And so our founders chose a site near that massive construction project to build our own Unitarian Cathedral. They hired arguably the finest architect of the day, the French born architect, engineer, and professor of architecture, Maximilian Godefroy, and asked him to spend no more than $100,000 on the cube-shaped domed building. Uh, and Godefroy took that 100,000 and maybe a little more and designed an awesome space. It was actually for a few months until the Catholic, Catholic cathedral opened, the largest public room in the United States. People entered this space under the angel of truth out front. She, they sat in this room where light filtered down from above with the light of truth descending from the oculus at the top of the dome. And they heard from this pulpit when it was raised quite high, the word of truth. The building itself had little decoration and no religious or sectarian images, only four shields in the pendentive corners representing unity and tolerance, fortitude and peace. But it didn't stay that way. <laughs> By the end of the 19th century, in order, some will say, to address the acoustical challenges of archways and domes, and also to begin to more closely resemble some of our social peers, we decided to Christianize the space. We put a barrel vaulted ceiling under the dome, so to reduce the volume of the open space and hopefully the echoes. We lowered this pulpit and we moved it over to the side, kind of like in an Episcopal church. And we turned the marble base of this pulpit into an altar. And then we commissioned the studios of that Unitarian cousin, Louis Comfort Tiffany, to create for us a mosaic of Jesus and his posse having a last supper together. Now, just for a sense of the scale of the building, I gave a couple of images. Here are the doors through which people enter and the organ loft above. And here's a photograph, I think, of the chancel itself, a little dressed up for a COVID era Christmas. And then here is a little detail of the Tiffany mosaic itself. It's about 12 feet tall and 28 feet wide. And it was recently exhibited through high resolution photographs at the American Glass Museum in Corning, New York. So we say, all are welcome at the table. But these two tables, which stand before our congregation, include a pretty Christian looking altar and a Tiffany mosaic of Jesus and the guys. These tables are so square, so ordered. 
The altar is in a place easily seen as reserved for the clergy. And the table of the Lord's Supper is a place of a quite definite hierarchy. There in the center is the place for the most important host, and the sides are spot, spots for the guests. And by tradition, the place where people are not sitting and eating is understood to be that side of the table where the servants come and go. Now, this is part of a longer study of the development of Christian iconography, maybe for another visit, but take it from me. This is a table about hierarchy. Is that the table to which we extend a welcome? All are welcome at what table? In the Baltimore story, we looked at our imagery and we changed our minds. Just as our forebears in the 1890s had changed their minds, in the 1970s, our mostly humanist congregation argued that we needed to balance the Christianity of the Mosaic with a broader range of religion. And so we added on one side of the Tiffany cross images of Abrahamic faith with the temple menorah and the words of the Shahada, the Muslim profession of faith. And on the other side, we placed the eight spoked Dharma wheel and the yin yang symbol, kind of shorthand for the wisdom and religion of Asia. But even that was insufficient by the 1980s when our women and religion group asked for a reassessment of many aspects of our congregational life, including not just the male-centeredness of our bylaws and hymnals and clergy, but the complete lack of women's independent presence in the sanctuary. I love that my congregation is not iconoclastic. We tend not to destroy the challenging iconography of the past, but rather add to what is. We use a little bit of the eraser from time to time, but largely we use the pointy end of the pencil. And so we designed and commissioned and installed two beautiful banners in our sanctuary. One of them here honored the earth-based traditions that were becoming part of our community of faith. The interconnected web of all existence is a banner that honors the connections we have with all living things through the evolutionary process of which we are a part. And it connects us with distant galaxies and names all of us the stuff of stars. And then the very precious banner that I most love, I think, is the banner that establishes women's role in our congregation and in our faith. See it here. It says something about relationships and something about place with the very top of the banner, our solar system, and then an outline of the Baltimore skyline of its day. And at the bottom, a group of women holding hands in a circle in the midst of a green space. We see it from two angles. From one angle, we see that the women are standing in a pool of moonlight, not that bright light of the sun. Remember the sun, the light of truth that, that blazed down from the, from the uh, oculus? No, not the blazing light of truth, but the deeper, more reflective, more fully wisdom-saturated light of the moon. These women have taken the time to notice each other around the circle, have welcomed each other to the circle, have come to know each other in their fullness, have come to find purpose in their being with one another. And look carefully, look very carefully. They have left a space the circle is incomplete. It expects to grow. It expects to change. It expects to discover something new. It holds a place, dear friend, perhaps for you. The welcome table our faith is constructing, my dearly beloved, is a round one, a table which expands as more arrive. It is, it is a circle to which we may all be loyal, 
where our actions may be faithful, where our horizon even may be limitless. And as a circle, it may be a place where the center may shift, where I, by stepping back, may yield a place for you to step in, into leadership, as it were, into healing when it is needed, into a just demand where you may make it, into the love that our faith so tries to be guided by. A couple of generations ago, universalists who had been trained by Dean Clarence Skinner at Crane Universalist Theological School at Tufts University would create a new symbol for universalism. You may know it. It is called the off-center cross. A large circle was drawn and then the cross was inserted, but not at the center. The cross stepped out of the center to display that a great mystery needed to hold that place. In this moment, in Unitarian Universalism, when we are claiming broader inclusion, when we are declaring a richer diversity, it may be time both to reconsider the meaning of old symbols and may be time to create new ones for this moment. In Baltimore, to declare that the old square tables that are hidden from us in our habits need to be transformed by reflection and deeper wisdom and more open spaces and by new people whom we are called to serve and who themselves have much to contribute. The old square tables need to be transformed into the round tables of our dreams. One last image, if I may, here. It is Pride Month, after all. In the wake of the HIV AIDS pandemic, and with the calling of co-ministers Phyllis Hubble and John Manuel as people who would specifically welcome gay men and lesbians into our church, a pink triangle with a rainbow was crafted to express our intentions. Not a round form, I notice, but a triangle that can hold us all, that holds us all, gives us the space to dance and a rainbow to inspire. As we are about this work of building circles and considering centeredness, may we find inspiration with each other. May we find community, may we find dancing. Oh, friends. May it ever be. Blessed be. Ashe, Ashe, peace, salam, shalom. I love you. Amen. I'm going to extinguish uh, the chalice where I am, and I'm, ex I'm expecting somebody over there to extinguish on your end. But can we say these words together? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And if I may, I will ask us to think back to those words that I began with. Um, William Alberts was my minister, I was a, a mentor for me early in ministry and a person who helped me uh, consider deeply the fact that our ministry doesn't happen mostly in our buildings and in an hour on Sunday morning. And this, uh, these words that he, that I opened with um, are words that I carry with me um, as I do the work in the world that is the work that I am called to do. And I remember our steeple is the aspirations of people. Our altar is the common ground upon which all persons walk. Our cross is the oppression from which any people seek to liberate themselves. 
Our creed is the deeply held belief that community enhances individuality and individuality community. Go, my friends, to live your creed. Blessed be.